both clinical and research work with severe and challenging behavior. Um, over the last five years, I've been working on a research project using telehealth to do um, assessment and treatment with uh, young kids with autism. So um, we've we've kind of it's been pioneered here, but certainly we've continued to to kind of run the research course in, at the university. I'll go after Matt because he just said everything that I need to say to you. So <laughs> I'm Kelly Schiltz. I'm also at the University of Iowa. Same department, same stuff, all behavior related. Um, <laughs> and my screen, I have it in gallery view and it looks like the Brady Bunch opening. <laughs> um, I'll go next on Mary Jane because I really loved the Brady Bunch. So that was a great segue for me. Um, I'm Mary Jane Weiss, and I'm the Executive Director of Programs in ABA and Autism at Endicott College, where I um, oversee the PhD program in behavior analysis. And um, I also do uh, work and research with the team at Melmark. And um, I said when they asked me to come on this panel, I don't know if I know anything <laughs> about this. I mean, I'm kind of an automatic yes to the folks on this panel, um, but um, I think my content expertise in these areas uh, is really dwarfed by the other panelists. But I said I'd be really happy to talk on, um, on the level of global ethics and um, ethical decision-making and considerations in this kind of unprecedented new challenge. And they all said that was perfect. So that's, uh, that was a good match for me. So thanks for having me. Yeah, I love that you're literally saying, Mary Jane, that I don't have a lot to contribute to this conversation. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, okay, you guys, we're gonna do a quick boomerang and I'm gonna send all this to you because it's gonna be really funny. So of you're course, gonna be like, boomerang time. Yeah, Welcome. this is happening. And everyone, <laughs> so everyone, because it's like the Brady Bunch, so everybody wave, hi. Oh, you guys, this looks so awesome. I don't know if you can see it. I'm gonna, I'll email it out to everybody. This looks great. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's like, what have I gotten myself into? Can you tell us who's in each square so that we can look the way the Brady, like, can we, can, can we look the right? <laughs> I'll look down, because yes. I'm on the top. <laughs> what we see is what we see, what yours, everybody else is seeing. I mean, am I in the top center? No, I'm no, on the you're, top. In the, you're in the bottom. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll email you guys. This is so, yeah, this, oh my gosh, it's so funny. Yeah, this I'm going to switch for me too. Yeah, Ryan, just. Ryan, yeah. why are there like 20 of you signed in? Oh, yeah, um, I <laughs> do not know, but I think it's because of a Zoom error and it's not actually bringing the people's right names in. Oh, okay. So, so Ryan is telling us we all look good and he's also asking if we need our camera on and he's asking. A bunch of yes. random. There's also 166 people in this already. Hi. Yay. Um, I believe folks can change their own name too. So if anyone's named Ronald O'Donnell, you can click your name in the top right corner, drop down more, and I think you can rename yourself. Oh, um, I wondered, Ryan. I was like, why are you sending us so many? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, Ryan, you're answering your own questions in there. Is this? <laughs> um, of course, my. Facebook Live is, Facebook's not wanting to connect. Nice. I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm Tina Patterson. I'm a clinical behavior analyst and international consultant, and I've been doing telehealth since 2007. And uh, I work for a behavioral health organization based in Tennessee. We provide developmental pediatric services and all therapeutic services on a nonprofit basis. Abby, David, what's up? Yeah, I think I'm the last one. Um, so I'm uh, David Cox. I'm a research fellow at Johns Hopkins University in the School of Medicine. Um, I got into behavior analysis through ethics, um, and I played around a little bit uh, by providing services for kids with autism. Just a little bit. Uh, yeah, for a few years back in the day. Um, then shifted over a little bit into behavioral health, substance abuse, um, but kind of throughout ethics has been something I've been really passionate about. So, yeah. And did you just literally move across the country like two days ago, David? Yeah, 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 like, yeah, two days ago. It's wild. It's, oh my God. It's crazy. Yeah. Abby. <laughs> I'm Abby. Um, I'm basically just friends with Ryan, so I'm here to help moderate the chat. <laughs> Very excited to be here. <laughs> Abby's coming to us from New York, so we got to send her some extra loves. She oh. went through his careers <laughs> program. She works at Fit Learning. She's awesome, too. Don't let her. <laughs> downplay her skill sets. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> 
I think Kelly and Matt, you guys are probably the only people representing a state that's not, that doesn't have a current shelter in place order, right? Um, yeah, we, yeah, we do not. That's correct. Just, just you wait. <laughs> you two can join us. <laughs> We're a three, matter weeks, of time. three weeks in in California. It's awesome. Yeah, no, that nope. governor, our governor's holding out. She's not going to budge. That's interesting. Yeah, in I know Chelsea, we, uh, we've been sheltering for, this is week five. Oh my so God. We, have, we have less than 100 deaths in the whole state. Yeah, in California, I was just looking at the data today, um, and I think we're doing, a, like, honestly, a pretty decent job um, of flattening the curve. Uh, but it's so interesting because I think a lot of the projections that I'm seeing in terms of being able to minimize the death rate, um, look at uh, social distancing measures, I think right now through like August, there's a really great um, uh, research body outside of University of Washington that it probably has the most up-to-date um, projections. And so I was like extrapolating. I'm like, does that mean that I don't get to leave my, like, we're going to be doing this for like another four months. Um, holy crap. But yeah, I mean, in Washington state, in California, I mean, we're seeing, you know, it's heartening to feel like what we're doing makes a difference. Also, maybe the antivirals that they're working, there's 10 of them in production right now. So they're testing them out. So that's yeah. good to know. I, I can only hope. Um, okay. All right. I'm going to get us rolling. Um, and then I'll figure out how to connect up my live stream. Of course, I'm getting errors for some reason, but I will solve that later. Um, okay. So we're officially recording. Boom. I'll switch over to this view. All right, cool. So, boom, boom. All right. Three. Sorry, I've got one more button to hit real quick. All right, folks, welcome. We're officially getting rolling on uh, the webinar tonight. Super grateful for everybody that's here. Um, I've got a few just housekeeping things. First of all, we're here um, to talk ethics, especially in this pressing time. We owe it to these six panelists, so please send praise as you see this, as uh, you may meet them later on in life, thank them for their expertise. Um, what we're gonna be doing tonight is going through a question and answer sort of format, seeing where the conversation takes us. These were all submitted from people that jumped in. We have over uh, 500 questions I sorted through. There's no way we'll get through them all. I tried to group similar ones and start to structure them and see if we can get through as many as we possibly can. For those that are here for BACBCUs, the code word will be presented a couple times throughout. I'm gonna pop that up at some point. Um, and there's also a feedback form that will generate for anybody that's in this webinar as soon as they leave. It'll allow you to uh, claim those and enter that sort of thing in. So that's all set up and automated, should be good to go. Um, if anybody in here happens to be in the Zoom room named uh, Ryan O'Donnell, you should be able to change your name. It seems like there's an error on the signup process. That's my fault and I apologize um, for that. What we're going to do really quick to get us started is just a quick 30 second elevator pitch from the panelists so you have an idea of who they are. Um, so I'm going to let David go first since uh, he was kind of the, the brainchild and what kicked this off. So you mind just giving us a quick pitch, David, tell everybody who you are, uh, I guess what expertise or perspective maybe you're bringing uh, into tonight. Yeah, so um, hey everybody, I'm David Cox. Um, I'm a, a currently a postdoc research fellow at Johns Hopkins University in the School of Medicine. Um, and I guess the, the area of passion that I bring to tonight's discussion uh, is ethics and behavior analysis. All right, I'm just gonna kind of read off Sarah. Do you mind going now, Sarah Cox? Sarah Litvak, did you see Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sarah Litvak, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm Sarah Litvak. I'm the CEO of the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence. Um, we, we've been monitoring COVID for a couple months now. Um, we had our auditors travel nationally, so we um, had noticed that there were areas that some organizations were starting to close their doors or make adjustments. So um, we were monitoring it from, you know, mid-February or so. Um, so we've kind of been the frontline responders for this um, until the BACB put out their statement. So we had three weeks where we were really like feeling the burden of the field looking to us. So I'm happy to share kind of what our approach has been. Um, but I come at this from the perspective of how do we ensure best practices for organizations and clinical quality for the patients that we're serving. 
Well, thank you so much. Tina, I'll have you go next. I'm Tina Patterson. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. I specialize in clinical behavior analysis, uh, dual diagnosis, so not just developmental disabilities, but comorbidities of mental illness. I'm an international consultant and I work for a behavioral health organization with developmental pediatricians and um, therapists, and we all work together in a nonprofit organization. All right, cool. Thank you. Matthew, you're up next. Hi, I'm Matt O'Brien. I'm a uh, psychologist and behavior analyst. I'm on the faculty in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Iowa. I do both clinical and research work with severe and challenging behavior. And over the last uh, five years, I've been um, part of a project, a research project, looking at telehealth for uh, young children with autism. All right, cool. Kelly, and then we'll wrap up with Mary Jane. Yeah, so I'm Kelly Schultz. Um, I'm in the same location as Matt. Um, so I'm a licensed psychologist, board certified behavior analyst at the University of Iowa um, on faculty in pediatrics there. Um, my specialty is also challenging behavior and have been um, part of um, most of the early work on tele research work on telehealth for challenging behavior um, with Dave Wacker and all the crew at Iowa. Um, and so that's the perspective I'll take is from what we know from research for severe and challenging behavior um, and some of our thoughts on how that may translate into practice. Very cool, thank you. And then Mary Jane. I'm Mary Jane Weiss and I'm the Executive Director of Programs in ABA and Autism at Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts, where I also direct the PhD program in ABA. And I also work with the team at Melmark in a research capacity. And um, I have had a career long interest in ethics and for uh, the last decade or so have been spending a lot of time teaching and training people in ethics, ethical decision making, um, how to address contextual variables in the context of ethical decisions. And so all of that seems very relevant to today's conversation and I guess that's why I'm here. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, so the first question that I wanna tip off um, and get going is around how are essential services and businesses defined at this time? And then maybe we can nest in there medical necessity, medically urgent patients. So who wants to kick it off? Maybe can we set up boundaries of like defining those? Um, I, I just want to jump in. So I'm going to be looking at this just from like the legal perspective of what's written in the law and kind of each region. And I think that's where we need to start first and foremost. So before we even go there, I would say check the CDC guidelines. So they have a list of some of those um, and what precautions to take if you continue to work within those parameters. And then the other one is that each region, whether it's a county or a state, is, is um, providing a list of what essential services are. Um, and they're pretty exhaustive. So um, from my perspective, everyone but two people basically are essential. So um, I think that's where we come in as a field is really defining, okay, great, there's all these services that are essential. You know, how do we figure out that medical necessity piece versus medically urgent piece? And I think we'll probably get into that discussion, but we can all agree the services we provide from an insurance perspective is medically necessary. And I think organizations need to really sit down and think how urgent are those services and what are they balancing to ensure the safety of their patients, safety of the staff that they work with, um, and then that how that fits into the greater community that they're into. So there's a lot of factors. I wish it was as black and white as we are or we aren't, but I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I think I would also add and really echo something you've already said, Sarah, is that it's individual you know, based on the company and then down to the patient. Um, so uh, every, every scenario I've run into with my international companies that I work with um, and then some of the national ones is we just have to look at it by case by case basis. Um, and it usually centers around three medical domains when we're looking at urgency. We're probably looking at maladaptive behaviors first, then we're looking at um, communication, and then we're looking at uh, uh, social skills. Um, and those are the three domains that we kind of have centered around on medical urgency. Um, and I think this has been hard for companies because we are by insurance definition medically necessary and they wanna keep their doors open. So you know that that's feeding into some decision-making, right? And so um, 
but I, I do think it's highly customized and individualized after you look at legal requirements, then you have to apply that on an individual company basis and patient basis. What do you guys think? Tina, if I could add to that, um, I, as I prepared for tonight, one of the things I kept coming across was that exact theme, which is the heart of behavioral analytic intervention in any context, which is the need for individualization and to look at this on a highly individualized basis. And so um, that's just a, another kind of um, truth I landed on as well. All right, cool. Uh, any other comments from the panelists? Yes, uh, I'm, a, I'm more of a question. I don't know if this is gonna help. help okay, no, go for it. Well. But I'm curious, um, as practitioners, as, as we make that decision, um, how are you all thinking about drawing that line, that yes, no, yes, it's urgent, no, it's not. Um, and, and, and there's no easy answer there. I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, um, but. Yeah, thoughts on that. That seems to be a really hard you No, know, I think, David, that's an excellent question. And what I, I keep going to is harm. Uh, is the child in harm? Is the family in danger of harm? So that's the first question I look at. So I'm looking at intensity. When we talk about magnitude in the field of behavior analysis and intensity, I'm looking at that high level intensity of problem behaviors that the family and the child could be in danger because they still have not reached any kind of level of um, sustainability in the home practice or clinic practice. So then being completely independent without support, how is that going to look? And is it in the risk is going to be high, right? So I'm looking at the data from before um, isolation happened and then, then what, um, what my prediction would be for what's going to happen. And so diving in on maladaptive behaviors, number one, self-injurious, physical aggression. I've got one little girl who has a GPS tracker. Yeah, she got, she's getting services, but we're not going into the home. So she's getting started. She was the first one to get telehealth services, but we're still not going into the homes. We had to really weigh um, the risk of exposing these fragile children who have other diagnoses, medical conditions as well, to the idea that maybe we bring something into the home. So uh, I've not had a case yet where we've been advising to go into the home. So really our advice has been centered around who gets telehealth first and then moving on from there. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I, I was gonna add, I'm not necessarily focusing on the characteristics of the patient, but I think it would be unfair to assume that if let's say we do a risk analysis like Tina suggested to understand the cost benefit analysis of providing services. And let's say we say the risk is high enough where we do need to see that patient in person. I think it's unfair to assume that we are gonna see them in person the exact same way we saw them in person before this happened. And I think there's a, an assumption that you're just gonna go in. And I think um, as an, if there's anyone who works for an organization, I would think about has the organization you're working with, if you are having to kind of be on that front line, what are they doing so that you're safe and that you feel that you're safe. And those are two different things, right? And I think communication is a big part of that. I know organizations that, you know, just continued on as if, you know, nothing was really happening. I know ones that are over communicating, they have town halls every day, every morning, three times a day sometimes. They're really hammering in the resources that are available to those individuals. So I think that's something too to consider is, look, if we determine that they the risk is, high enough to take the, you know, that we need to take that risk, what can we do to make sure that we're mitigating um, any risk of exposure at the same time? Um, I also wanted to add, so I think Matt and I come from a different perspective, um, mostly because the clinical work we do is on an outpatient basis and we see that we see patients once only. Um, and so for us, we've had to sit and consider they've already been on wait lists for eight months um, and they're on wait lists for challenging behavior. And so, you know, I think our situation's a little different because we don't have those developed relationships um, with those families um, at this point. And so we're having to consider, um, you know, what do we do? And again, I agree with um, Tina and Sarah about the um, checking for harm, you know, and all those things and evaluating that and then making the decision about I mean, at least in our situation in the hospital, they're not allowed to come into the hospital um, at this point. And so 
you know, we have to either then cancel the visit and say, well, we'll schedule you in as soon as we can when things open back up, um, or now their the hospital, ironically, is finally allowing us to um, move them some visits to help to telehealth, and we have to figure out then is that going to be safe or not. Um, but I think just for those of you who maybe aren't seeing patients on a rolling or ongoing basis, I think that's just a different consideration that we're faced with because like I said, we see them one time for a very brief outpatient visit and then we typically don't have contact with them unless the family follows up um, with that for some additional consultation. So just another thought to throw out there. Yeah, and Kelly, just to kind of piggyback off what you said, I mean, one exception to that is we do have our, our intensive day treatment clinic, and we do see those patients um, over a, a few weeks with very intensive services. You know, anyone could argue that all of those patients, um, the, the services that we provide are medically necessary. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, our outpatient services, we, we've kind of put those on the back burner and said, hey, if we can do telehealth, we'll do telehealth, but we've been pushing really hard to get the day treatment clinic into a telehealth model, but, but, but with consideration for who's appropriate, and, and I know we'll probably get into these questions, but with consideration for who's appropriate for a clinic like that, um, you know, we, we certainly have some reservations about serving some of our patients via telehealth due to, due to the harm they may cause. I wanted to just add to Tina's statement about the, like, the risk, the, the like, aggression and self-injury and things like that. I also think we have to look at the, um, the I guess, the age of the patient too. So I think we all know how important early intervention is. And, you know, I think as a field, we push for that so, so much. Like as the developmental and chronological gap, you know, age gap increases, um, it's much harder to catch up. And I think that is something that should absolutely be a consideration as well as to, you know, again, two weeks, sure, four weeks maybe, but at what point do we, you know, kind of balance the time spent away from those patients who, the, you know, as we know, three months for a three-year-old is the most precious months, right? So I think that's something we should also be considering is not just those who have like physical, you know, aggression or kind of self-injury, but um, organization or individuals that have some kind of skill acquisition needs as well. Yeah, and, and Sarah, just to play devil's advocate there, and I totally agree with you. I think, you know, when the brain's malleable, we've got to be doing as much as we can to, to support those kids. Um, but kids in Iowa right now are not getting school services either. So we're, we, we currently have a gap for all kids in education right now. And I think there's questions about, um, you know, access to services and equality among all of our kids. And so I think that's one of the challenges here in Iowa is that um, no kid is getting services. And so I think it would be hard, at least for some here, to argue that they need to um, uh, push for services for young children with autism over, say, all kids. At least that's one of the arguments that you hear. Yeah, I would probably question the fact that if they could find a way for each teacher to deliver instruction individually face-to-face -face with the students, they would. I just don't think they have the modality to do that. Um, so if they had enough teachers to go into every individual's home, they probably would find a way to do that. But I do think they're getting uh, alternative education, right, which is this kind of tele education that we're seeing and certainly as a field we're doing that as well with telehealth so I, I, I would agree with you that it, it's not an all size you know one size fits all I would agree like not everyone should be getting that but I think that we have to kind of look at the fact that we're dealing with uh, patients who are at greater risk than typically developing individuals. I think one thing that's really interesting that's coming up in a lot of people's comments is some of the meta principles that ethics are based on, right? So if you look at the APA core principles that they have for psychologists, they talk about things like uh, beneficence and non-malfeasance, right? Which Tina talked about, right? In terms of do no harm. But they also talk about things like justice, which is interpreted as access to services and equality in treatment. And I think that's why we're all so heightened in terms of our awareness of how important the decisions we make are in this context, because these are in fact touching on all of those meta principles, as well as all the individual and contextual variables and idiosyncratic situations. And I think that's why it's so incredibly challenging. I also think, Mary Jane, that, um, yeah, completely, absolutely, I, I love the way you said it, because. Um, I think what we're running into some of these small businesses, these small clinics, they are struggling with 
how to keep the doors open, how to serve the clients. They have limited access and competency for telehealth. And so they're thinking, and, and this is what they are saying, how do we replicate clinic and home to telehealth? And I keep saying, you're not going to. It's not gonna look like that. You're gonna to have to check in. You're gonna to have to teach parents. You're gonna to have to do some observing. So you're gonna think less about DTT and running programs and more about helping families with structured routines and closed token economies and fixed differential reinforcement schedules. You know, so, and really kind of straight, and I'm gonna tell you what I'm running into. I'm just gonna be honest here, guys. What I'm running into, we've got a lot of young BCBAs and a lot of novices who don't know FBA. They don't know how to run an FBA. They don't know the components of an FBA. They don't know the research. Um, and I'm, I have to tell you, it's very disheartening. It's disheartening to see that they know their skill acquisition components, but they don't know the behavior reduction components. And That's what the research literature us. says too. The research literature supports that in terms of the lack of expert training in that area. Yeah. I, you know, I was just going to say one, um, I think positive about this is there's some organizations that we know have closed their doors and thankfully they have the resources to continue training their staff. And so I've seen so many organizations step up and say, we're going to go hard on training our RBTs and training our BCAs. I think there's going to be a huge like growth opportunity for a lot of people in our field. Um, and I think there's some who have, you know, not been able to keep their staff, unfortunately, and have, you know, furloughed them. And I'm really grateful. I don't just want to do a shout out to Central Reach for opening up their CEU library for free, because I know, you know, a lot of folks have been taking advantage of that. So I'm hoping, Tina, to your point, I, I've seen that too, but I'm hoping people are going to take this to like do a mini study session. <laughs> while, while I think all... it's a wonderful opportunity for some research, right? I mean, telehealth research, we got all this data coming in now and now RBT training. I saw something posted on Facebook yesterday where somebody was doing an RBT virtual academy and has a whole schedule on times and days. And, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> so I, I, I echo your sentiment. So I'm gonna pull in something real quick here. Uh, I compiled a resource list for folks. I've pasted it once, I'm gonna paste it again in the Zoom here. Um, that was compiled by uh, all the panelists, basically myself. We just threw in as whatever resources we knew about, including some of the literature, things have been known there. Maybe I can queue up. There was a lot of questions regarding like, how do I become competent in telehealth services? What do they look like? Tina, I know that we shared a bit of this, what it looks like, so maybe I can lean on you with that again, but I know Kelly Matthew here as well. I don't wanna like limit to you, limit to y'all. Um, and so maybe, can we touch on like, how do you build your competencies in there? Where do you go? I know there's some fantastic articles I read today that y'all have that we can point people to for specifics, but let's, let's hit that for a minute. Well, I would, uh, I'm going to just jump in um, with, so Matt and I having done um, quite a bit of research using telehealth um, for severe and challenging behavior, um, I will say it's, it sounds like it would be easy. You just jump on the computer and you do it. Um, it's not. Um, <laughs> there, I mean, this whole conversation around competence is really an important one to think about because it's, it's just not that easy. You think, Oh, I can just tell people, but if your vocal language isn't great and you're not good at coaching other people on how to do things with just your vocal language, it's going to be really challenging because we can't model anymore or it's really hard to model what you want somebody to do. You can't jump in when you need to provide assistance and things like that. And so um, from what I've seen on Facebook, just kind of floating around on at least my news feeds, you know, there's lots of things out there. People are offering lots of resources. Um, but I would say, especially for severe and challenging behavior, because um, the research isn't, there's so many limits that we just don't know how well telehealth, when it can be used, when it can't be used, what the timing, the dose of all that looks like. Um, so for severe and challenging behavior at a minimum, I would say for competence, reach out to people like Matt and I or others who've done this um, and ask for some supervision and some consultation. I think most of us would be happy to do it. We do really like doing our work by telehealth. We wouldn't wanna do all of it by telehealth for sure, um, but we do enjoy it. Um, and we've 
we are huge advocates for it. And so the more people we can get, and we are in a prime opportunity, if, the, if we're going to do this, we might as well take the data and disseminate it and really begin to, um, uh, you know, get out there what those limits are. When is it effective as well as when is it not effective? We need to know just as many things about when it doesn't work as when it does work. And so um, my biggest plug would be just reach out to us and ask for um, that consultation, that supervision. Maybe we connect in with you for a session or two and we give you feedback. Um, you know, I mean, I think there's lots of different ways that can look, but um, I would, I, maybe I won't speak for Matt, but I will speak for Matt. You can reach out to me. I will do my best. <laughs> um, well, um, I know Kelly and Matt, why don't you guys talk a little bit about your research? Cause it's, it's sure. really good stuff. Yeah, hey Kelly, thanks for um, volunteering me. Uh, <laughs> I know you're really like you don't have anything to do right now. Yeah, yeah. Real quick, I can talk about the research real quick. I wanted to add something. Kelly's right about this. I mean, it's the, it is another skill set that's not inherent in the stuff we do in vivo. And the two things I would recommend is one, you develop checklists of the different things that you have to develop. The skills, kind of skill survey, you need to develop, but also have a really um, thorough fading plan. You're fading in these trainees and you're fading yourself out. And if you don't have that plan in place, um, there's gonna be a lot of mistakes made on that trainees part that, that in some cases you, you can't take back. Um, in terms of the research, you know, Kelly's been a part of this a lot longer than I have. I've been the PI of a NIH funded research grant um, recently um, over, over the last handful of years. And um, you know, the, the research that we have started with um, what you would call feasibility studies. So it's can you use telehealth to provide the same types of services we do in our clinics? And those studies were done early on. Um, believe it or not, at the University of Iowa, they've been doing telehealth since 1997. That's a long time. Um, and, and in those early studies showed, you know, it's a viable, it's definitely a viable modality. But then we moved over to comparative studies. And those comparative studies looked at if you, if you see kids in vivo or adults, even if you see individuals in vivo and you see them via telehealth, do you see differences? And, and those studies have shown that telehealth is an effective approach. It's just as effective as, as seeing those patients in vivo with the right patients, by the way. I mean, there's, there's a, you know, we have to definitely qualify that statement. Um, but we've moved on, believe it or not, our, our current research project isn't even, a, an asset, isn't even um, evaluating telehealth as a modality. It's no longer the independent variable in our research. Um, it's just the way in which we can reach a larger group through, through, uh, through our research. We have folks both at, um, at uh, Marcus Autism Institute, Nate Calls there, Dorothy Lerman and Lukia Sami at uh, University of Houston that we've been collaborating with on this. And, and in a big rural state like Iowa, um, you know, we're, seeing, we're, being, we're able to reach the entire state in, in Texas, Georgia, very big states. It's, it's a remarkable thing to be able to reach these folks who previously wouldn't have been able to access our services. Anyway, oh, real quick on, on the research, what we are doing is it's been a series of studies really looking at FA plus FCT. Nothing, nothing um, um, you know, nothing real complex. Um, evaluating these kids, identifying function, and then going to um, functional communication training to, to address their problem behavior. And, and um, study after study uh, have, have shown really good effects. Yeah, and that, that specifically is that you can teach parents how to implement these sort of things and have the outcomes, right? Yeah, and, and that's a really crucial point. We're working through the parent. In clinic, we have this tendency to want to jump in and do everything our, ourselves. And, and via telehealth, we're working through the parent. And so there's a skill set, going back to that competency question, there's a skill set there involved in communication with the parent and, 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 and being able to coach and provide feedback that if you're doing this in vivo, if you're doing this yourself, for example, um, you, don't, you don't hone those skills. You just do it. And, and here you're, you're, you're really coaching people to do it. Um, coaching for the, for the FA, because we're not trying to train our parents to run the FA. We're coaching them, but in the FCT, we're training them. We want those to be lifelong skills. So maybe I can pitch this to y'all because there's uh, dozens of questions centering around where are the ethical lines as to who should be delivering that telehealth service? I don't think it's an ethical question. It's a payer's question. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, so and you have to look at your billing code and billing authorizations. I think there's only a handful of payers that are allowing uh, RBTs to provide telehealth. Um, most of them are having the BCBAs do it, but that's changing every day. We're getting new updates. Um, and then I think there's some limitations on parent training and who can do those as well via telehealth. And from a practice standpoint, oh, go oh, ahead, Sarah. I was just say, from the research perspective, I'm guessing anyone can do it if you train them correctly, but <laughs> that's from the payer perspective. Yeah. 
So from a practice perspective, I was just going to weigh in and say, since I've been doing telehealth since 2007, an international basis, I, um, you know, didn't require anybody be an RBT until 2014, right? So then I started offering RBT training and parents were signing up. And all of a sudden, I've got parents in England and Scotland and in uh, the Middle East. And, um, and I'm like, hold on, everybody. <laughs> what are we doing? You know? But what, they were so desperate for the information. So what I started creating as a model for boots on the ground in the country where I was being a consultant so that I could talk directly to someone who knew what I needed them to do. And then I had less telehealth because I was doing more supervision and coaching and then they would send videos in. So it really was about tweaking what I needed to do as the clients came my way. But I've now got it to a model where it, either the parent or someone they've hired in the community has been trained and they're an RBT now. So that's one way I've been doing it. Cool, and I know a lot came up around safety and you kind of noted this, but Kelly and you all, I was reading your article where you were talking specifically about the ethical concerns and it was noted in there. Um, but maybe the, the whole panel here, how are you, how are you approaching drawing those lines of what requires in person as opposed to could be feasible through this telehealth model? Can I ask a quick follow up uh, to some of yes. the earlier research before we jump into this? Because I sure. think it'll form at least my thoughts on it. Cool. Uh, but I think uh, Matt and Kelly, one of you had mentioned that there was a, a, spe a specific type of client or patient that seem to do really well with telehealth. Um, could you maybe, based on the research, outline what that looks like? Who seems to do well with it versus not? Um, so I'll jump in on that. Um, so our work in Iowa, um, all of our projects have been with children six and under um, with autism and challenging behavior. The severity of the behavior has not mattered um, from what I can tell from the participants we've had, um, but they have all been six and under. And so I think we have to be cautious, right? So I think the safety concern, this is where it comes in, is, you know, what's your comfort level in seeing people when you can't jump in? I would not, I would not see an adolescent who's bigger than mom um, and severely aggressive um, by telehealth because I can't keep them safe. I can't keep the home safe. Um, from my side. And if I was going to do it, I mean, I'd have to have an emergency plan in place. You know, I'd have to be able to tell them, you've got to go to the ED if something happens um, or have somebody on call and ready to go. Um, and so I think we do have to think about that really well. I also think um, when I talk about the limits of it, all of the kids we've seen in research have social functions. And so we've never had one with an automatic function that we're aware of. The one I can think of, um, which is in the, we have an article out on negative effects um, and we evaluated two kids that FCT failed for that we did by telehealth. Um, and one of those kids um, had a social function when we started, but when, but when FCT failed and we went back and reanalyzed the data, it appears that function changed to become automatic. And so in that case too, we just don't know how best to conduct an alone condition by telehealth, um, you know, or then to treat an automatic function um, in that way. And so I think we have to weigh all of those um, characteristics that a, a child or somebody is presenting with and our own comfort level with how do we support that or not support that um, through telehealth. Kelly, can I just add one thought? So just to, just to, and I know that, that you met all of our kids that have, the targeted behaviors have had social functions. Um, clearly our kids have other behaviors that are automatically maintained. But um, as Kelly was saying, you know, we've, we've worked almost exclusively with young kids with autism, but I think we have to be real careful about saying that that limits whether or not we should be seeing older children, children, uh, adults even, uh, via telehealth. There are ways in which we can work with some of those individuals where we don't have to evoke those same types of behaviors that we might in a functional analysis. We, we've had to submit some paperwork for our day treatment clinic here, and one of the arguments against it was, well, your research supports working with young kids with autism, but if we don't 
um, if, if, we, if we use the same types of procedures and uh, as we did with the Osung kids, we, we, we maybe can't guarantee safety for all of those, but we can modify what we do. But I also think, as, as Kelly said, it's the comfortability of the therapist, but it's also the comfortability of the family. We've had families who have said, you know, we're, we're okay with some of this stuff. I mean, we see it every single day. We're okay with seeing it. That doesn't mean that as a therapist, I have to agree to, to, to work with that individual. Um, but, but I think we have to consider that comfortability on, on both ends. And, and once again, going back to, to who's good for this, we don't know. And this is the chance for us to find out. I think we've, we've had some HIPAA requirements, um, some, um, legis, you know, some rules and regulations across the states lifted or at least kind of suspended. Um, this isn't a chance for anybody who wants to do telehealth to jump out there and do it, but it is a chance for those who do it and who now are able to do it from, from a you know, fee-for-service type standpoint to document what they're doing, who they found were, were good candidates for this, who wasn't. Um, and, and always remember, even if we can't do the types of treatments, you know, we don't have to do a state of extinction with everybody. We could be doing telehealth and working on antecedent strategies to minimize the likelihood we're going to see those behaviors. We don't have to evoke those behaviors purposely with every patient. I think that's an excellent point. And I think, you know, we were talking about the characteristics that make a patient acceptable for telehealth or those types of services. What I would say is we also need to look at the staff and the parents. I think that that's, those are two like very important uh, pieces of information. So I think if, if a parent doesn't want services, I think that's okay, you know, and we have to respect that choice. On the other hand, I'm seeing some things in the comments about like, what if I don't want to provide services? I think that's the same thing. If you're an RBT or BCB and you don't want to provide those services, that's okay too. I think that we need to, we're all making a huge, we're having a huge exercise in flexibility right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay to just be self-aware of your comfort level and say, you know what? I don't, I don't think I can do this. That being said, I think you should know that everyone is figuring it out together, right? So if something feels uncomfortable, it doesn't mean it's wrong right now. And usually... If something feels uncomfortable, sometimes it means it's wrong, but that's not what's going on right now. So I think you have to kind of balance, you know, is it just my discomfort with change, which I think a lot of, you know, type A personalities, if you have a graduate degree, you're one of them probably. So, um, you know, those type A personalities might say, gosh, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't be doing it. It just might be a growth edge for you. And I think to piggyback off of that, I would tell her, right, give yourself some grace, give the families some grace. We're all stressed. Um, we're all navigating whatever this new normal is and whether that's going to stay our new normal or whether it's going to shift backwards or shift even more a different way. Um, I really think we need to give everybody grace and just let it roll where it's going to roll and be honest with yourself and be honest with the families um, as to, you know, what those decisions are and what those choices are that we have, what are those preferences. Um, and just kind of go with it, but just keep checking in um, and being available, but do give yourself some grace. And I think it's really important to support a wide variety of choices individually, as practitioners, as families, as organizations, because there are many factors that could um, increase or decrease people's levels of comfortability. Um, I would like to um, introduce this topic to the group. So um, since I do specialize in dual diagnosis, um, on intake, I'm not just doing a behavior checklist, right? So I'm doing the pediatric symptom checklist, which is a mental health checklist. I'm doing an ACEs checklist. I'm looking for trauma. Um, and I'll tell you why this is helpful. Because SAMHSA, uh, has reported that 70, 70, 70% of people with autism and other developmental disabilities have a comorbid mental health condition and it's not being addressed. So I'm usually getting the patients that someone else has referred because they ran out of their strategies after they looked at the autism behaviors and they didn't know what to do with the anxiety and the depression and the PTSD. And I think that's okay when we're talking about if this is outside of your scope of competence, it is okay to say, I can't do this, but please do not leave that family stranded. Refer them on to someone else. There are BCBAs, there are people out there who can do this. So what happens when I take intake on my checklist? So one hour, one hour, and I do all three checklists. I get the family to tell me what's going on and I know how to have this relationship with them and get them to talk to me. Then I assemble a team of people who they can access. 
because I know I'm not the only one. I'm not going to fill all the gaps of all therapy services, but I know who I need to bring in, right? And then I do quarterly visits and sometimes half-year visits if they're in another country. But I do visit with these families and they know, do know who I am. And I'm talking about kids, you guys, with emerging psychosis. I'm talking about children with mood disorder and autism. And we've, we really got to step up and, and we cannot abandon these families. If we're going to be sequestered for the next three months, four months, we're the behavior analysts, y'all. We can figure this out. And so let's grab that, maybe even create a, a list of referral sources so that when you run into a family that they, you've tapped out and you don't know what else to do, that you know who they can call in that area, especially with telehealth now and being expansive and make sure that you can provide services in that area. But um, I just wanted to let you guys know, I have incorporated that, but I've, I'm a BCBA with 20 years in, right? So, and I was a special ed teacher before this. So sc scope of competence has been building. I didn't just jump in knowing all of this, right? I've been building. There are people though that you know. Um, so what do you guys think about the idea of like a referral database or something? I love it. And uh, Tina, I think this issue you bring up was an issue before COVID. <laughs> um, I know we've done a lot of consulting with like um, state payers, like we just got finished a contract with Utah Medicaid. And one of the challenges they had was that, um, well, it's interesting because, you know, you guys, Matt and Kelly work in a hospital. So I'm curious whether you have this, but typically in a hospital, you have like a department that diagnoses cancer and then the other department treats the cancer, right? And no one ever worries that there's a conflict of interest that they're like, diagnosing a lot of cancer just so they can treat it right but a lot of payers have acknowledged that there's some companies and maybe agencies who di diagnose autism and then treat them with aba and it's kind of like a self-referral source and so in a hospital system that doesn't really raise any flags but the reason is is because doctors are trained to look for everything right so they just happen to find cancer um with aba agencies what i see a lot of and we look for this when we accredit organizations is those organ those individuals who are doing the diagnosing or doing the testing they need to be trained to look for everything and you do have some clinicians who are trained on the ados and only the ados and they're going out there and saying autism 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 and they're not catching anything else so that was something that was absolutely an issue before all of the covid uh pandemic stuff happened so yeah I, I'll just add Sarah you mentioned you know working in a hospital and, and in a clinic I Kelly and I both of us I, I I'm going to speak for Kelly here we're kind of all comers I, I would say um, I serve on a bunch of boards for autism uh, the, the governor's autism council I I'm not particularly interested only in autism I mean I think ABA is for everybody and, and so um, I think the challenges are those diagnoses that qualify you for certain services, certainly limit the amount of services people can get. And so one of my concerns, even with, with um, telehealth, is that as we push towards getting people more access to telehealth, it's not limited to just autism, or, or as Tina's saying, just individuals with autism without comorbid conditions, for example. I mean, I, I think it opens up um, the option and the opportunities to work across many different disciplines, many different fields of study, and serve these patients based upon the symptoms they have, not just based upon a, a, a litmus test of they have autism or don't. Now, add to Tina's comment, you know, I think a resource list would be wonderful because I think we're in this fortuitous position at the moment where state licensure laws are loosened, and so we can still we can actually provide some services across state lines without having to necessarily be licensed. Um, I know some states we do have to be licensed in those states even to practice across those lines. Um, but this may be a really great opportunity to, to get some of those additional services out to those families who need it when we already know that those expertises are limited. They're, we're not going to have one of those maybe in Iowa or, you know, all of the resources that a family may need. And if enough families get a hold of it, I can see some advocacy efforts going through the roof in them saying, get rid of these state boundary laws because it limits our practice for people who have very discreet um, expertise. How do those families that need it get that um, when they don't live within the same state lines? And so um, I think a resource list would be amazing. <laughs> I was going to add to one thing that I think will be a positive about this situation. I'm not, this is a terrible situation, but I'm seeing some glimmers that I think will mm -hmm. positively impact the way we interact as, as people. Um, 
you know, as we all know, there's just, we're fraught with regulation throughout the entire country. And as you know, um, if you have an MD in other states, you're able to come to New York and help them practice because they have such a shortage. And I think that we're starting to realize that some of these arbitrary regulations from state to state may not necessarily be as necessary as we once thought. So I'm hoping that it'll create at least some cohesion, Kelly, in line with what you're saying across state lines. And I'll just add, you know, um, at our organization, we're ANSI accredited. And the goal of ANSI is to create standardization across state lines. So the idea is, when you buy a light bulb in New York, that light bulb screws into a socket in California, right? You're not having to buy a different light bulb for every state that you work in. Same thing with your sockets, right? So the idea with ANSI to be like an American national standard is that you should have this continuity of care across state lines. And that's one of the things we're working closely with ANSI on is how do we create that for behavioral health? Um, and part of that is creating guide guidance on practice across the nation, right? So not just each state is doing something different, but what our organizations doing nationally? What should documentation notes look like? What should telehealth standards look like? So all of that is kind of the goal is exactly what Kelly's saying is there should not be a different treatment modality if you just cross the state. You know, you should be able to get the same quality of care. So I know we kind of touched on this, Kelly, when you offered up your, you and Matt <laughs> to reach out to, but um, I had uh, 2020, 2025 or so uh, questions centering around like, are there specific places that people can go to for any sort of training for either their BCBA or their RBT before they go out there? Or do they need to go to the research, the literature and things that we provided? Like how, where do people, what's the point of entry to, to, to build up staff skill sets? I think in terms of telehealth, that's going to be reaching out to people who've done it, checking the research. I'm not familiar with any specific training programs um, that have a telehealth training component to it. Um, I think that's a wonderful idea for training programs, um, but I don't know that I'm not, there may be some, but I'm not familiar with any. So I would say reach out to the people who do it and the research that's existing. Okay. Yeah, Sarah. I, I, yeah, I was just going to say there's one train, one video online that I love. Um, if you've heard of Motivity, Emily McCullough um, is, I think, their chief clinical officer. And she actually did a demo session that's about an hour with her nephew. She got consent from the parents to run telehealth sessions with them. And it's an hour long video that shows everything that, um, telehealth can look like and she links like all the re all the the places that she has them do the exercises i'm going to link it in the chat when i'm done oh yes please do so, so that video is awesome if you just need like a crash course the other thing is um ellie kazemi from csun and denise rios from uh georgia um they just did they're doing a two-part telehealth training series for us at bhcoe it's open to the public you guys can all attend the first one they did today at 1 30 it'll be on our virtual academy tomorrow we're making it you know, open, like everyone can access it. So check that tomorrow, I'll link it. And then the second one she's doing on Thursday, and that's going to be on telehealth supervision. So she's basically called all the research, all the practical applications, she has videos, and um, they're, they're, I mean, it was awesome today. Like I learned so much and I cool. read up on some of the literature. So highly recommend those, I'll, I'll link all of them. Okay, but cool. I'll reiterate, we're all figuring it out. If you haven't done it before, it's a steep learning curve. And I think everyone's just trying to do their best. Um, and I want to bring that up because there was uh, a slew of different questions from people that were asking specific things like, how do I conduct one-on-one -on -one, or how do I conduct certain types of DTT programming or social skills and things like that. And when we formed this, David, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the, the goal was to kind of show that the specific, super specific questions like have not been answered necessarily. And we need to have a discussion about how we approach these, right? Like it's a much larger discussion than just, this is what you implement. Yeah, I think so. And, and kind of what I was hoping with this conversation is to talk about what, what do we know? Um, what are the situations that we're in? We're going to have to provide services, I think, in unique situations that are outside of all of our um, learning histories. And so how do we go about doing that? Seeking out the, the supervision and competence training that we need. Um, and again, as, as many panelists have men mentioned already, um, where possible seeking up with researchers. You know, we do have an opportunity here to do a lot of good for the field and our literature base. Um, so. All right, cool. Um, is there any other thoughts when it comes down to telehealth or questions that people may have? We've offered a lot of resources. 
if I could recap, like there isn't a one size fits all um, and people are having to build off the research that's there and there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Um, any other ethical concerns that panelists may want to bring up around this? I just want to add, I saw some questions about like whose responsibility is it to teach or like to learn these skills? Is it the organization? Is it the clinician? And I just want to echo that. I think um, hopefully if you're in a nice cohesive work environment, you're collaborating on these things, right? And you're kind of brainstorming and someone might have an expertise set that you don't have and vice versa. And you're working in a team. Sometimes maybe you're a little bit more isolated from your team. You have to take it upon yourself. But just remember, ultimately, you're a BCBA and we have the tools and skills to teach ourselves anything. So I think ultimately, it's, I don't think it's a finger pointing exercise. I think it's where can I get what I need? And if I'm not able to find it, how can I find it myself? Cool. And then one last one to kind of maybe close up the telehealth. We'll see if it comes back up. But um, are there any practical guides, tips, things that have come from uh, to help trying to train parents or work with different caregivers in different settings. I know that you all did a lot um, in this area, but people are struggling sometimes with motivating people, organizing sessions, things like that. So um, when we run sessions with parents, um, I think one, a couple of things I would probably think about. So one, I would slow it down. I think we're used to people coming into clinic and we just go, 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 go. We know where everything is. We know how we work, all this stuff. Um, it, telehealth, I think families are, I would say a good majority probably are comfortable with technology. I think we all FaceTime, we all do something, um, especially military families, they're used to all of this kind of thing. So I don't know that the technology per se, although there are families who don't know how to turn on a computer and, you know, so we have to work through some of that. Um, but I think when you start a session, we always start them with, you know, the first few minutes, we just kind of touch base, like, hey, how's the weather in your neck of the state, you know, and just normal like things, because, um, and especially in our projects, we actually never met the families in person. Um, so I've never shaken a hand of a mother. Um, that I work with by telehealth and I've never actually given the kid a high five or you know anything like that and so um, I think to just continue building that rapport you want to start with um, slow it down start with you know some hey how you doing kinds of things you know give some instructions you know kind of relay back what you did last time and what's going to happen this time you know just provide some structure around what's going to happen then go run however you're gonna run it. And then at the end, again, check in, you know, and set up, you know, how is this going to go? Like, how do those, how are those meetings gonna get scheduled? Is that gonna be in their email? Are they gonna get a link, you know? Is it the same link every week or is it a different link? Um, you know, just all those things. Um, I think also be prepared for disruptions. There's a ton of disruptions and now if, everybody's home you've got the four kids and dad and the dog and the cat you know i think there's going to be lots of disruptions the doorbell rings the phone rings you know there's just all these things and you just kind of have to navigate through them um and i think from a coaching perspective um well i guess another before i get into coaching one thing you probably want to tell the families to do is get everybody off their streaming services because it will disrupt your internet. And then what you need to see is gonna be so slow that it's just not gonna work. And so we're families and be like, oh, I'll keep all my other kids occupied by streaming Netflix or letting them game. Um, that is not gonna be helpful to you. And so what you wanna do is tell them, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to get them all off. <laughs> um, you're gonna have to find something else to do. Maybe dad can hang out with them. Maybe they can go outside and play in the backyard. You know, I don't know, um, thinking through some of those um, logistical things. Um, and then for coaching, you know, I think, again, you got to work on your how you communicate with the family is if there's ways you can model things, um, you know, by hand gestures into the camera, you know, do that. Um, but just talk with them and then figure out where those barriers lie. We've had families, you know, the screaming kid in your ear, mom can't hear me talk. So do you need a Bluetooth speaker? Um, do you need to send them instructions that are typed out ahead of time to give them some heads up because they may not be able to hear you or they may not be able to understand what you're saying? Do you need little signals because 
the kids reactive to your voice coming through their computer or because they have autism, they're obsessed with the computer and they just want to hang out with you, you know, and so you just kind of have to work through a lot of different um, things that we maybe don't have to deal with as much um, in person. So just a few thoughts out there. When I was listening to Kelly talk about that, it just struck me um, how different it really is from business as usual in the way we've been doing intervention and the kinds of considerations she's talking about are really totally different than the kinds of things that we think about when we're just focusing on intervention at the clinic or intervention at the home that we're providing. And I think that's so important. Somebody mentioned it a little bit earlier too. It's really a different set of goals, a different set of skills. Um, and what you're accomplishing with the family is totally different from what you used to accomplish as an interventionist. And so I think about some of the things that we need to be orienting to and thinking through with the family, because now they're going to be intervening in such a direct role. And, and some resources are coming out from ASAT in the next couple of days um, that I, I know they're working very hard on getting some things out there that are very family friendly. But things like start with goals, you know, what's being worked on? How many of these things are functional to work on in the home? What are the priorities? What can we not afford not to practice? What needs modification so that frustration isn't too high for management within the home? And what are the things that we might put on hold for a wide variety of reasons, whether it's because they're pretty complex from an instructional perspective, or whether it's because they're likely to evoke challenging behavior, um, or whether because we think they're not high priorities. And so we might be willing to relax some of that and focus on things like motivation and focus on some logistics. You know, what, what does the family need to get done? How much of the day can actually be devoted to instructional sessions? How much of the day maybe needs to get devoted to supporting the individual in other ways? How are we gonna use the coaching sessions? So I think um, when she was talking, it just kind of made me, it drew a picture from me of what this really looks like. And it's radically different from what intervention looks like when we are the interventionists. But I think it's so important. And I think it's absolutely teachable and absolutely scalable. But I think it's really important for us to view it that way. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Sorry, uh, Mary Jane, that's incredible. I'm glad you said that because I start teaching now my RBTs and all my staff. The first rule of telehealth is to remember you're a guest in someone's home. Just remember, you wouldn't show up with uh, if you went for a potluck dinner at someone's house uh, with all the ingredients so you could cook it when you got there. You show up, you're prepared, you have your hair done, brush your hair, wear a nice shirt, <laughs> smile. It's a gift. <laughs> they like that. <laughs> you know so i guess what they're calling soft skills now but remember you're a guest in someone's home that's the first primary and i think matt mentioned it earlier is that building that rapport and kelly mentioned relationship we've got to bring that back and if we have to bring it back to telehealth and let's bring it back we've got to build relationships so i said all that to say this which led me to my resistance of act for years, I was like, oh, that's for the mental health people. Somebody else will do that. But with telehealth and practice, I found that I needed more skills interacting with families. And I needed to stop thinking, this is my goal for the session today. But I needed to say to the family, guess what? It's snowing in Tennessee. We never get snow here. What's it like where you are? And I have the apps and I can look up their weather and I talk about weather. And then they get comfortable enough to say to me, you know, we didn't sleep well last night. Um, Dad's been gone. He's been offshore for two weeks. Tell me what's going on. What are you thinking about? And all of a sudden it becomes a little bit of act where I'm getting that parent to tell me their private thoughts and verbalize them. And then all of a sudden I've got a goal bank for parents. And then I can spend time with the family. And then all of a sudden I'm building a relationship just from screen to screen. And so that's when I became act trained last year and it has changed my whole telehealth approach it's changed everything i think I do. it's 
it's become really clear in the last few years about the real need for behavior analysts to develop more soft skills. And we've gotten a lot of feedback from research that's been done about the things we don't do well. And I think we really need to reflect on that now because you know, as a species, we've never been more vulnerable or more in need of compassionate responses from others. So we really have to think about, I think, you know, upping our game in that context now. So right. I just want to add, I think everyone, um, I, I and I agree, I think the act said the soft skill stuff, amazing. Um, I just happened to see a comment, so I just wanted to make a quick comment, quick. Oh, that was a lot of quick there. Um, <laughs> somebody had commented about teaching the kids to stay within the frame of the screen and i want to just mention that in the work we've done with telehealth um so we're working with challenging behavior so we're not asking the kid to stay at a table in a chair um you know and so it's a movie i mean they're running around the room and those things so just some other things to maybe think about is we often we don't our the equipment we always used was as cheap as we could go so we didn't, weren't, didn't have the ability to move the camera or anything on our end. So often we were telling parents, hey, can you tilt your screen down or whatever? But in our initial sessions, we were constantly being like, okay, can you put your computer, your phone up on the mantle? Let's see what that view looks like. Okay, what about this? Or if the kid um, does elope from the room, you know, it was, okay, can, what about a bedroom where we can close the door? Um, instead of the big living room. But then sometimes the bedroom didn't work out and we needed to go to the living room. So how can we arrange the living room to keep you occupied? And so how much of the room can we see? And so just kind of throwing out there that um, just more of those things we probably would never think about in a clinic. Um, there's just so many more things you kind of have to navigate through in the first and we usually spend a good one or two meetings ahead of time, at least in our research projects, with figuring out where does that stuff go before we ever start um, any of our evaluation and coaching things is really just, you know, we've had families who attach the camera up in the corner of the room on the wall somewhere. Like, I don't know where it is, but they <laughs> figure out a way to get it up there and then we can see more. Um, but a lot of times it's, hey, tilt that down for me. I can't see them right now. Um, and so just kind of thinking that, because we do not force them to just stay. And I'm not saying anyone would force the kids to stay in the chair, but it, keeping them, teaching them to stay on screen is not our role that we take on. It had always been, okay, we'll maneuver the camera. We'll have mom maneuver the camera um, so that we can keep an eye on the child in that situation. All right, I also so think it takes about two to three sessions and then everybody gets into the swing of things. But it's funny when you're up on a, uh, on a, on a bookshelf and they leave the room and you're like, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm stuck. <laughs> you left me. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to pivot a little bit, if that's all right, into uh, what I've been kind of group grouping into like leadership decisions, things that are going on in the organizations that are putting people in some sticky spots. Um, I've got a number of like examples. One that actually came directly, our most upvoted question from the Q&A so far, I'm just gonna read it out loud. It says, how do you suggest BCBAs approach non-BCBA employers about suspending services for clients where it's not essential in states where the governor is deemed ABA as an essential service? So if employers are unwilling to cancel services, how do BCBAs ethically navigate how to proceed? I mean, I guess, I guess I can take that one. <laughs> um, so I think as a BCBA, you should absolutely consider um, the transition plan that you're going to put in place to transition them. Um, I think that it, this is back to what I was saying, where if you don't feel comfortable providing services, you shouldn't. Um, I think that the two questions are, do you feel comfortable providing services? And that's a separate one. And then do you you, does the patient need services? And I think if the patient doesn't need services, and that makes it easy for you. If they don't, um, if they if they if they do need services, then I think you just need to decide whether you want to transition out of the case and find someone who will um, take over for you. But I don't think as a BCBA, I don't know if you could really impact their ability to shut their entire operation down. Um, but I think that you need to look at that particular patient and see, again, those risks and benefits we discussed and 
I think I'll give you an example. We've had we have an FAQ on our website, so and we have people submitting questions constantly, and we're updating it. And a lot of the questions we get are, um, I have a family member who is 85 years old that lives with me that has, um, you know, asthma, and I'm still going into one patient's home every day. I go home, and that's it. Back and forth, back and forth. They're self quarantining when I'm not there, or self isolating. I'm self isolating when I'm not there, right? So you have kind of a closed system where mm -hmm. you know, there's there's issues they need to take care of, but you know it's not going anywhere. But that individual still feels like the risk isn't worth it for grandma who you know is in that risk class. And I think that's an absolutely fair reason to say I'm going to tag myself out for this. And I think that I would encourage any employer who's listening to be supportive of those decisions. And I know all the organizations that I've talked to have been incredibly supportive of those personal decisions. I know I had a, a colleague of mine the last week that was fired because of his stance he had to take on the clients and it wasn't in support of, it wasn't in the vision of the organization's leadership, how they want to go. They wanted to keep providing services and weren't listening to those. Is that a reality that people are having to face as a result of this? Um, Ryan, I think like the language you're using, the stance probably speaks to maybe why he got fired. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think that it should be like, this is my stance. And if you're not doing this, it's unethical and you guys are all right. And I think I'm seeing a lot of this like emotional reactions. I think that it needs to come with, this is my personal decision as an employee. I don't feel comfortable. You know, let me know when I'm able to reconvene. I'm happy to do tell right? Like, I think you want your your team members to be working in congruence with the system and saying, how can I help? I don't want to go into the home, but I mean, you have to realize every business owner, every organization, not just in our industry, every industry is under duress. So I think coming at it with, you know, you guys are unethical, like, you know, trying to change it. I don't know if that's the way to approach it. I think the yeah. way is like, I've assessed the risks for myself. This is where I feel. So, um, but I do think like across our industry, I mean, people are getting furloughed, laid off. It's just the reality um, of the world we're in right now in every industry. So. Any other comments on that? It just kind of made me think of, um, it's just another version of a black hole discussion, right? You don't want to talk on an ideological level. You want to talk on an individual level. That's what I hear Sarah saying. Yeah, and I saw a comment saying this is where the soft skills really come in handy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that um, what I seem to be hearing is a lot of um, rule governed behavioral responses. So this is what the rules say, and this is what I think we should do. And, and much to your point, Mary Jane, is that uh, you cannot get in that black hole discussion. You just have to humanize it. You have to, um, there, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm hearing, I'm hearing something lately that keeps ringing in my head. If I can't hear you, then I can't see you. So if we're not listening to each other, then we're really not seeing each other. And so as a behavior analyst, are you hearing your employer? Are you expressing what you need to be heard? Um, and how are you doing that with empathy? Um, and compassion and some conflict resolution skills, right? So how are we going to find, not, we're not going to do this, but how are we going to do this? Like, I am an essential service provider. How am I going to make this work? So if, the, if we don't learn how to do this in the scenarios that you're in right now, there will be other scenarios that come your way in your life. Well, you will have to learn your conflict resolution skills. So now is a really good time to hone in on that. I think part of Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add, I think there's also, it's, I don't think it's as black and white as I don't want to provide services. I think it goes back to also, if you and the organization have deemed that it's essential to provide those services or urgent to provide those services, I, again, I would understand if he says, I'm, not, or I'm just assuming it's a male for some reason, I would, <laughs> I would feel like it's a different story saying, I'm not going in unless I have a mask and gloves and, you know, some of these other um, protections in place. But of course, if the organization is saying, hey, go for it, no sanitizer, nothing, you know, you have to go to three patients in one day. Of course, I would say I'm not standing for this, you know, like, so mm -hmm. I think, again, like, 
I'm hoping no one's doing that. I haven't seen cases where that's happening um, unless it's someone who's maybe like very isolated and not really aware of what's we, going on in the world. But we do have yeah. an, we do have an anonymous question that says uh, essentially, does it mean if people, if organizations aren't following the CDC recommendations, is it in violation of our ethical code? Is that like something a BCBA should be standing up for? Um, I, I don't think that the CDC, that it's a BACB ethics issue. Um, I think the CDC recommendations are pretty black and white, and I don't think that they're that challenging to follow. That being said, I will make note that it is challenging to get a hold of protective equipment right now. So there are certainly cases where it's the recommendations are not easy to follow for anyone, not just ABA providers. Um, and I would hope that organizations have some systems in place to account for that, whether it's a policy recommending to make your own mask or whatever it might be. But I think there's some temporary fixes in place. I think there is some relevance to the code, though, in terms of really kind of being in compliance with um, with laws and regulations that have been issued. And so we wouldn't disregard that. We can't disregard that. Um, I hear what you're saying, Sarah, and I think, you know, protecting individuals with the appropriate equipment is a problem in hospitals and in group homes, right? I mean, it's, it's definitely hit us in those ways. Um, but I, I do think that um, bringing it up as an issue, if someone were to be disregarding that, not speaking to it at all, I, I think it might be something people would want to raise. Does anybody else think so? I would just note that I think my my reason for saying it's not related is because it sounds like it's the organization as the entity that's making these decisions that aren't really held by the BACP code of ethics. But I would absolutely agree as an individual, you should be aware of it. So yeah, I, I think I think we're saying the same thing in that sense. Well, and this is where those conflict resolution in my mind, maybe I'm oversimplifying it in my head, but I've been involved in so many crazy scenarios in the past 20 years with companies coming and going, making up their own rules, not be related to BACB guidelines because they're you know, private equity or whatever. And, um, and in the end, you know, Sarah, I have a very similar um, history to you that one company was shut down and within 24 hours, we had to find new homes for over 100 individuals and they can never work in the state of Tennessee again. Like what? You know, and that kind of stuff still going on. So how do you approach it as a BCBA to these non-BCBA folks? Um, and, and that is that conflict resolution piece, right? So what, that's what I'm talking about is like representing. So listen, I know you may not. So even with, when we work in schools, it's the same scenario. Schools don't have the same accountability piece that we do, right? And so it's like really educating them on HIPAA. Listen, I can't really share what the family shared with me. Oh, it's an IEP meeting. You've got to tell me everything. No, I'm sorry. I really understand what you're saying, and I appreciate it. And if it, it was um, very important, I would make sure that you know that these are things I, I cannot share with you, right? Or, or anyway, with, with companies, you know, who are making these decisions, there's no PPE available, and, they, and you have to look at why are they making these decisions. And so you got to say to yourself, okay, how do I resolve this? How do I resolve this conflict? without ending services for my client, without losing my job? How do I make some sort of resolution here in a very um, self-aware kind of way? Like I'm aware of what's happening and I, can't, I cannot make a stand uh, for codes and, and ethics without really understanding what's happening in the environment. And these, there's this interplay that happens uh, uh, when you are aware of both sides of those contingencies. And, and I just don't think it's a strength of some of our BCBAs. We don't practice these scenarios that when things go sideways, how are you going to respond? When you have a boss who asks you to do billing, that's inappropriate. Or you don't know it's inappropriate. It's the policy. It's the policy of our school district to do the, you know, <laughs> I've had to stop so many unethical behavior when I work in schools just because they've always done it this way. And I'm like, yeah, we're not, no, not going to do that anymore. <laughs> but um and, and I think it is with a smile, but it's also with the very much understanding and compassion, shaping successive approximations, <laughs> reinforcing small steps. <laughs> but it's like everybody gets put on a behavior plan sometimes. But um, I do think we're all saying the same thing. You have to weigh both sides of that seesaw of what's going up and what's going down and where's the equilibrium coming in in the middle. Um, I just wish more BCBAs would reach out for help. 
right? Um, instead of reading the ethics code and saying, this is the black and white scenario, and this is what I have to do. Well, and here's one scenario that was submitted, for example, it said someone in my household was diagnosed with COVID-19. My company directly states that as long as I am not displaying symptoms, I am to come to work directly with my clients and their families without any period of quarantine. That, that is not legally accurate. And I would, I would question any organization that has sent that out. And I would question the person who submitted the question to read it very carefully, because <laughs> just not legal. Okay. Um, I and I, I, I saw a number of uh, comments kind of in the, just a minute ago of like, these things are happening. And I should have prefaced it with, I don't know the degree to which, and when you set up a form here that, that is either anonymous or somebody, I, I made sure to redact everybody's names from and things like that. Um, I don't know how prevalent I guess they are, but here's another question that came in that's been upvoted quite a bit. So it's saying, can you expand on the statement regarding the business pressure to continue providing services? So strictly from a financial perspective, wouldn't it be more cost beneficial to suspend services? Continuing to serve clients, whether telehealth or otherwise, may be a financial cost to organization, but ethically in the best interest of clients. And I know there's some perspective taking to, to do here, but can we, can we maybe share like different perspectives of what, like it's not as easy as that, right? I don't think fine. I don't think fine finances are like the indicator here because just remember if everyone in the clinic gets COVID, you have to shut everything down anyway. So I just, I don't think it's like, I don't know many orgs who are doing it on a financial basis. I do think that there are some orgs who are saying, we provide medically necessary services our patients rely on us and they're having to do risk assessments on whether to continue doing that. I know most of them have significantly reduced their caseloads. Um, I don't know anyone who's like, oh my God, business is great, you know? Um, so I, I, I don't think that, I, I think you have to figure out how do you do the most with the least amount of resources um, and everyone's trying to figure that out. Since you have a little bit of it, uh, I guess, any other thoughts on that? Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think what, um, what I also kind of heard in that question is that uh, going back to like this, it's not black and white issue also. The, there's so many layers of complexity and everyone's in a unique situation. Um, I guess how, how, how I kind of heard that question is that it's possible that in some situations, businesses are continuing to provide services and losing money as a result. Um, and I think that, that that's a possibility that exists that I hadn't really thought of, you know, I was thinking more of, oh, businesses are staying open to make money versus closing and losing money. Um, and so I, I guess that kind of layer of complexity is how I heard that question. Um, and I think it's an interesting um, additional wrinkle to this situation that it's not, even this question in and of itself, our business is staying open to make money or not, um, is perhaps more complex in some situations. Um, there was an article in the New York Times this morning, actually, that talked about, so they did some comparisons to the 1918 flu that um, this is um, heavily mirroring. Um, and they actually showed the the industries that shut down completely during the um, pandemic and those that didn't. And they showed that long term, they fared the same economically. So I don't know if there's a clear like, you know, it's, I don't think that anyone is doing it to kind of get out on top necessarily. I think that ultimately we're all a little, you know, screwed. <laughs> so yeah, that's a fantastic article. Would you be able to link to that in the... Yeah, I'll send it to you. Because yep. um, I'd be curious too, like, I just think of so many sectors of society, like what were those businesses that were included in that? You know, to yeah. be candid, I think they looked at like manufacturing, like, so it's, it's, it, look, it's just pattern matching, right? Like sure. our industry is so different, but it's, it's data. So yeah, I think they looked at manufacturing and some other, I'll, I'll pull it up. I can't remember exactly. Oh, that's what fascinating. Like, like they am, so I don't Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which goes into this whole thing. You know, I think that's a resounding theme that keeps popping up that everyone, most of the people get in this field because they really care about helping others and everyone's really just trying to do their best. Um, and yeah, it's just interesting. tough decisions all around. Yeah. I'm not providing any answers, just compassion. I, I was going to say, I've seen a lot of um, back and forth too about center-based versus home-based and which one's safer and, you know, how do I do that? And I've actually heard arguments for both. I've heard, you know, the example I used earlier where folks are self-isolating, um, you know, they're only seeing one patient. Um, and so they find that, that's an easier approach for them. And then I've seen others saying, as an owner, I can control the cleanliness of my clinic. I can't control the cleanliness of the house and all the people that, you know, are going through there. So, you know, I've seen arguments on both sides. I, there's a good graphic I'm going to find about why there's, there was an argument made that home base is safer um, just because you have less foot traffic coming through there, ideally. Um, but yeah, I, again, like I think everyone is genuinely trying to do what they think is best for their patients and best for their staff. 
And is that a, is that something that it's again up to the individual to outweigh, you know, where are, how do they sort out like understanding what data they do have and like what decisions to make? So for example, the number of contact points that a client may be um, potentially trans, uh, have something or contacting something or transmitting it, like we don't know those variables. Does that make sense on like where this is coming from? And I, I and there's a number of questions there of, uh, that people are asking of, like the fact that they don't know that the data that they would typically try to respond to is causing this dilemma. Is there anything that you are suggesting or think of? Probability. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dave. Oh, as I say, what, what's uh, I'm not going to provide another answer. I just like throwing out fun facts and make us think again. <laughs> uh, the other interesting aspect of all this too is we know from basic research on probability discounting decision making. Um, and it, as everybody's risk preference differs too. So even if we had all the facts that were laid out in front of us, um, you may have a different risk tolerance than I do. And that doesn't mean that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. Um, that's just the way that preference shakes out with choice behavior. Um, so then throw on top of that, that we don't know the facts. There are a lot of uncertainties and things are changing daily. Um, and it becomes a complex decision, I think as a team um, that has to be made. There's a resource through the ADA, the American Disabilities Association, of questions you can and can't ask the people that work for you about their health. Um, and they have a pre-pandemic questionnaire. I don't think they realized there'd ever be a pandemic, so now it's just called the pandemic questionnaire. Um, but it lists, like, you, you can ask questions in a very pointed way to figure out what the, whether the staff are appropriate to work in those conditions. So it'll say, in the case of a pandemic, um, can, uh, do you have any family members that might be impacted by the pandemic in the case, right? So it lists all these scenarios that you can use to determine whether you or someone you're working with is at risk. So the, the idea of like, you're living with someone who's immunocompromised, the family members, anyone who is abroad should be, you know, self quarantining for two weeks, no one in the home, no one out of the home, right? So you kind of have to take all those steps and you, you can't take this lightly. You can't just say, oh, it's fine. Um, and I, I would encourage anyone to really read those CDC guidelines because there's very clear steps for if you are going to do this, this, I, I looking, it's like, it's a little bit like uh, teaching safe sex, you know, <laughs> like you can't just say, don't do it. Right. Um, you have to say like, if you do it, here's how you do it safely so that we don't get STDs and we don't get pregnant, you know? So I would, I would approach it from that perspective. <laughs> Any other perspectives on that one? Um, Okay, cool. So, not queued up here. Um, there was two other things here. So, Sarah, again, I think this one probably starts with you. But um, is there? Do you see companies diversifying in any sort of way right now? Like, so telehealth seems to be one of those that people are immediately moving into. What are other potential options, or is that it? Uh, yeah, telehealth. I've seen some who've been doing online social skills groups. Um, which is kind of fun. I've seen all those Zoom memes of like all these like preschoolers on Zoom, so I imagine it's something like that. Um, I think folks are uh, doing some tutoring. And then this one I think is a little controversial, but I've had some providers reach out saying, is it unethical to um, provide like childcare? You know, because like let's say you have parents who are essential workers and they can't they can't be at home with their kids and they're asking like, can an RBT just be the child care worker? So I think that is fraught with a lot of ethical challenges and I don't think that the therapeutic relationship is poised for that. Um, but in an ideal world, that would be great if you could just provide child care. Um, but I have had some organizations reach out about that, but I, I unfortunately don't think it's a viable option. Um, Can I just add, you know, I, I think when you mentioned telehealth, everybody's thinking of telecommunications through like video, audio, visual, but I, one thing I would say is I don't think we're forced only into that. I think at least in our organization, they're giving us the opportunity to work with some of our patients via telephone if needed. Um, there, a, lot, a lot of good can be done just over the telephone or even via emails, but you know, obviously you've got to respect some of the issues with HIPAA and whatnot, but, but I think those are, you know, don't don't uh, don't think that it's, it's telehealth or nothing. I think to support our, our, our patients or our clients, we really have to think about some other options. Yeah, it was one of our comments here is like, how does this work with families who have limited resources, single parent? Um, is it essentially just limited to people that are privileged enough to be able to access those sort of things? And one thing that I saw in reading and preparing for this, Kelly and Matthew, I think, and I can't remember which article, I read a bunch of stuff the last few days, is, uh, 
the the loading system, right? That you all had set up. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So I will preface this. So remember, ours were all research projects. So we were in the luxury of having <laughs> federal yeah. dollars to um, we had a lending library, and so. Um, families who didn't have the needed equipment, um, we were able to send them laptops or tablets, um, those kinds of things. Um, families that didn't have internet access, we were in the unique position of being able to purchase that access um, for the duration of the project. Um, but again, that's research. I don't think that's probably going to be very viable in a clinical situation unless the agencies have something like that available in the resources, but I highly doubt that. Um, but I will say we, over the course of all these projects we've had, so we had to start with laptops and things um, early on because the technology wasn't great. We've shifted a lot of families. We've been able to use their, we've been using tablets, but also their cell phones. We've had some really great, we've been able to get the same stuff even with families who use just their regular cell phone. They just prop it up um, and I think they're just using their network and I think I read somewhere like what 96% of people have a cell phone or something like that and so um, there may be ways around some of that technology um, and like Matt said you know the um, we're not limited to just video conferencing it might be able to be a telephone call um, at least at Iowa we are able to build for those telephone visits we were not able to do that before um, but now we can bill for those telephone visits. Um, but also maybe even think about some asynchronous type interactions. Can they video record something and send it to you and have you um, evaluate it and call them and give them some feedback and consultation from something that they video recorded? Um, so I think there's some other options within the umbrella term of telehealth. I think that's really important too, because we don't want to be making assumptions about how available those resources are to families, how comfortable they are, how familiar, um, whether we're increasing stress with those expectations, but even families that have those resources may be having trouble sharing those resources right now, because there might be five people in the house who are using that computer for some of their Zoom sessions with their teachers, for the other kids in the household, or both parents may be telecommuting. And it may not be the case that even if those resources are available, that they're available all the time for the purposes that we're envisioning. So I think it's just kind of another layer of individually assessing where is this family on, um, you know, on their ability to allocate resources in these ways, in this case, the concrete resources. And, and I love the idea of thinking about all kinds of other ways to stay in touch, including asynchronous methods um, as check-ins. So I think it's important. It's just all about the flexibility we keep emphasizing. Well, I was wondering if any one of you guys could address the issue. It, in my head, I don't know why it's stuck there, but I thought Iowa Medicaid was reimbursing or covering access for technology through the durable medical equipment component. Uh, do you, does anybody know about that? I'm not, I'm not aware of that. No. Something to look up. We can look it yeah. up. Um, to kind of piggyback off of that, uh, are there repercussions that providers are going to face for suspending services? Like if there is no viable option, um, people seem to be a little bit worried of like, okay, uh, telehealth or in-person isn't a viable option because of the risk factors. Telehealth isn't being denied. Like it sounds like that's where we talked earlier about like the referral is probably pretty key there, but what else comes to mind? Are there repercussions? <laughs> I, I was mean, gonna say, so I think um, the first thing I wanna say is that, as we all know, the OCR has reduced their HIPAA enforcement guidelines. So um, I think just looking at that as an example, we're gonna enter a period where enforcement of certain guidelines, criteria, laws are gonna be looser and more relaxed, which I think is great. Um, I wanna add that it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be HIPAA compliant. It just means that, let's say, a ch child is having a tantrum, you can quickly FaceTime the parent, right? Like, it just means that you can make accommodations to reduce HIPAA compliance if you need to. So you should still be HIPAA compliant. But I, I say that as an example because 
I strongly believe that while this is really good, we're gonna see a lot of kind of relaxing of these guidelines and standards. I do worry um, as someone who's like, you know, when we accredit, we work to reduce risk and liability for these organizations. I worry that six months or a year from now, our organizations, our provider networks are gonna be dealing with employment lawsuits. Um, I think that we're, I'm worried that we're gonna be dealing with a lot of ethics complaints to the BACB. Um, and I worry that there's just going, to, you know, there's gonna be some people who are gonna take advantage of the system, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, I would say that like the repercussions of suspending services, I would hope that there's no repercussions because there's going to be someone else who's going to pick them back up, um, right? So hopefully those organizations are going to find another organization that can, they can transition them over. Um, I, I saw leaders who did that reacted two ways to the situation. And I'll, I'll explain which one I am too, and there's no judgment on either. Um, the, the one is, oh shit, there's a problem. Let me react quickly, right? And before thinking through the data. And there are others who are saying, I'm going to take some pause, I'm gonna figure it out slowly, I'm not gonna shake the boat until I know what to do. So I think that the, um, the piece on, um, you know, kind of reacting quickly, I know as an organization we do that, right? Where you're like, how do you stop the bleed when you know that you're gonna start bleeding, right? And you quickly cut off and then you slowly release and kind of say, okay, it's gonna be fine. Um, so the ones that quickly cut off the bleed, I saw some clinics who just said we're closed, right? And they unfortunately didn't put any transition plans in place. They just told the parents we're suspending services for two weeks, we'll reassess. So, and I think that, that that's the choice they made. And I think that they probably assessed that there were some patients who didn't need that support. There are others who continued providing services. It's a different type of risk, right? They're still sending people into the home. They're still kind of, hopefully, I know some providers who said my, one of my patients got COVID, one of my staff got COVID, right? So there's risks on both sides. I would hope that as a community where um, supportive and that we're understanding that people were genuinely trying to make the best decisions possible and assume that the majority of folks are doing that. So I have a question I want to tag on that, Sarah. So I've got a few companies that have shut the doors, okay, but they weren't run by a BCBA. So I've got BCBAs who are clinical directors who want to provide services. And when I say shut the doors, I mean like they're never going to open again. Yep. They're yeah. in other countries. They're like, that's it, I'm out, right? So I've got BCBAs who want to take over they want to start providing services for continuity of care and also um, to make sure that, uh, the, that, the, that, the, that the viability of the program stay you know, in, in effect. So um, they're asking me if it's ethical to recruit, right, from another base. And well, I said, I wouldn't say this is not the same. They're, that organization doesn't exist anymore. They've been left without services. You're not recruiting. You're making services continually available, but I'd like to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, I would say it's not an ethics question. It's what does okay. their employment contract say? So I think that's what it is. Is you have there's to no at, more employment. Well, yeah. yeah, but there's 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 always a clause for what happens if you leave the company or they leave you, right? So I think that's one thing to consider. But I would say all bets are off in this situation. Right, right. I think everyone would understand if you kind of went and took those patients if they're no longer seeing them. Okay. I would agree. I was going to add to um, the conversation too, just in terms of when you were talking about being in such a reactive mode, it is a crisis and people are reacting in all kinds of ways for all kinds of reasons. But I think it sort of underscores the need to remember some of the lessons we know about good ethical conduct, right? What are some of the things that we should be doing all the time? So um, for example, you know, closing the doors without any kind of referrals to other providers who might still continue to be open during this time. Risks you being accused of abandonment, right? But even taking small measures like, um, like notifying people of alternative providers might have reduced risk in that case. But also everyone's talking to everyone, keeping records of who you're going to, who you're talking to, what you're doing as an organization to try to decide might come back to really help you in terms of seeing the methodical nature with which you tried to make these impossible decisions. So in keeping a record, being able to document what you were doing, when you were doing it, um, what kinds of ways you tried to mitigate negative consequences. We talk about those as kind of um, meta skills in ethical conduct across lots of much more usual situations. But it's important for us to remember them in these 
very unusual situations too, because um, I think the level of anxiety is so high in all of us and the need to respond is so urgent that we might be forgetting some of that too. Can I jump in really quickly? Yeah. Is that okay? Hi, hi everyone. I've been in the background, um, but I, I just wanted to just offer um, some perspective. Uh, I agree with, with everything that everyone's been saying in terms of, you know, that there, there's not necessarily one right answer. We're all, you know, navigating this constantly changing environment. We all need to continually have compassion for each other. But I also uh, really want to iterate as much as possible, um, you know, we need to show up for the families that, that we're supporting. Um, all of us are in, you know, challenging situations that if you would have asked us six weeks ago, did we ever think our life would look like this? And we would all say, no, <laughs> what the hell is going on right now? Um, but even more so for uh, our families um, that have children with special needs uh, and other individuals that are in need, um, they're even more stressed. You know, we're seeing increased rates of domestic violence that's going on across the, the United States. Um, you know, now we're getting to points, depending on where you are in the country, where, where people are concerned about, am I going to be able to, to feed my family? And I would, I would just stress to, to our community that we're an innovative bunch. Um, and so, and I think Matt said this earlier, like now is the time to be doing like really interesting research. We're, we need to ask the questions that we might not have ever been able to have the opportunity to ask before, but like, God damn, like we're so well positioned as behavior analysts to help solve problems problems that go far beyond ju just autism. And so I would just really encourage all of you guys, I, I applaud everyone for coming on to this webinar today to continue to want to seek a better understanding, to want to continue to expand their knowledge. But especially for people that are serving individuals right now, I, I just implore you, we have fought so hard, so hard to show how important our services are for these families that I, I can't help but think that if we come together and we really, you know, look at how we can continually build on our research, how we can systematize things better, that we can continue to offer services to these families um, because they deserve it. And, and my concern is that, that if we don't show up, if we don't show up now, um, how are we going to respond to funders and to families after this? Um, and again, I'm not suggesting that anyone put themselves in, in a dangerous position, but I, I'm just simply suggesting that our, you know, fundamentally our, our founding forefathers and mothers were radical, man, and they were doing some thinking outside the box. And so this is a time to take a page out of that playbook. We can so do better. Let me, let me pitch this back to y'all. That's great. I love it. I always stand on that soapbox too, of like, we can save the in world, right? <laughs> um, what do we, so there's, a, there's, I think that's a number of us that can, can approach those different, uh, approach that in different ways. What about the reality of what we've built into this system though, of the RBT, the behavior therapist, that was reliant on that week to week paycheck. Like that is not a viable option for them. I would say, if I was grossly stating for everybody in that category, can we pivot some time to that level of, therapists like what can they do as just, a potentially furloughed unemployed broke having bills to pay next week are you I, just up I, to I completely agree with sarah first of all i think i want to just like sarah said it perfectly so i, I don't want to butcher the amazing message but i, I just want to add to that we have fought as a field anyone who's here who's had a job in the last six months it's because we fought to say that our services are medically necessary Right. So, you know, the field, if you look at like the growth rate of the BACB numbers, it's because there were people out there like Laura Unum, um, like Michelle Trevetti, these parents who fought and said ABA is necessary for my child and I can't survive without it. Um, so I, I just want to remind everyone about that. I think in terms of what RBTs can do, just remember help is coming. Right. It's it might be really challenging right now, but if you work for an employer, if you're not self-employed, uh, even if you are self-employed, you can you can apply for the pay, payroll protection program. So hopefully your employer will be getting funds to fund their payroll for the next two months, which means they can rehire you and pay for that payroll until things get back to normal. So I guess that's just the first start is, you know, that the other thing is request to push all your bills, call your credit card company and say, I can't pay my bill. Will you push my due date by 30 days? They will say yes, they will not charge you interest. Um, call your landlord and say, I cannot pay rent. Can you push my rent for 30 days, 60 days, whatever it might be. I'll be honest, we did that at BHCOE. We called our landlord and said, we're not paying rent this month, right? So, you know, 
ever, this is not the time to apologize. This is the time to take help when you can get it. Um, and this is the time to really come together and say, it's a shitty situation. We're all in it together. Help is on the way. And hopefully the stimulus bill will, will really, really help push that. Um, so I don't know how we're going to change the world, Ryan, but I think there's at least some, some short-term things we can do to just reassure ourselves that we'll be okay. And, and I was going to add, I think something that might be helpful, um, similar to all of all of the panelists that are, are here today offered to, to share documents. And, and again, and I've said this in a number of different webinars over the last couple of weeks, the kind of collaboration that I'm seeing right now, I haven't seen in my in, entire career. And I hope we never go back to the way it was before, because this is incredible. And I'm just so thankful that that if this is a if one little silver lining of, of what's happening. Um, but I agree, Ryan, to, in terms of what you were saying earlier, um, I think that, you know, especially as a former ABA organization owner myself, yeah, we make our money off of RBTs and off the backs of these people that are, you know, the least compensated. And so I, I think we also owe it to them because your customer isn't just uh, the family that you're serving or the client you're serving. It's also the people that work for your organization. And we owe it to all of them to do better. And so I'm wondering if an output of this discussion today couldn't be a really good uh, resource uh, kind of guide, folder, Google Drive for RBTs and perhaps, Ryan, we even look at having a more focused discussion specifically for this group that kind of outlines more clearly some of the things that Sarah just said. Because I think for a, a lot of us that have potentially more experience in work, uh, maybe different access to different types of resources, I, I wanna acknowledge that we might have access to information that not everyone else at an RBT level might have. And I think that what we wanna do right now is reduce the disparity between that. Um, and if we're info sharing and collaborating on such a high level at the at kind of the BCBA, BCBA D, um, you know, kind of tier, I think we should also make sure that we are both, you know, setting an example and also taking care of those people who frankly are in the most vulnerable positions. And I think what this pandemic has shown all of us is that all of these people that, you know, we were, would cast aside in our previous lives are now becoming the most essential people in our lives. Like the people that are bagging our groceries and the people that are out there farming and the migrant farmers, like these are important people. And I think that RBTs often have felt like, you know, the, just the lowly workers in ABA and they are not. And so this is an opportunity for us to show care. I think you felt that, I think you said that really well. And I think in addition, sometimes people are feeling like they don't have a place necessarily to have a voice in this or they're scared to speak up in these situations. And I, so, I honestly um, don't know what to tell people in that case. So uh, I want to address what do we do with this and how do we change the world? So, um, so this is my bird's eye view. I was a special ed teacher before I became a BCBA. And, and in 2006, when the Congress said, yeah, we're going to make sure that ABA is uh, medical necessary and mandated that all insurance providers cover it. It was great. What happened to all the kids who didn't have autism? What about those ADHD kids and those ODD kids? No, and what the, what the uh, special ed criteria calls emotionally disturbed kids, your ED kids, they don't get RBTs. They don't have that parent advocacy group that the autism world has. I love what they have done. So much like what the civil rights movement did for Brown versus Board of Education and then moved in and ushered in public law 94-142, what we call IDEA, that came in on the piggyback of the civil rights movement. So how do we now move our RBTs into schools and drive a workforce of paraprofessionals that are skilled and trained and then we're an army. We're an army of behavior analysts and scientists across not just medical necessary, for autism, but for all kids who have skill acquisition problems, who have behavior problems, and don't have autism. I mean, I'd go a step further than that and say, if you look at the solutions to the risk for all of us, they're all behavioral solutions, social distancing, hand washing. And I look at those things and I say, what can we do to help advance these goals, right? Um, so. I mean, our science is underutilized. Um, there are populations that are ignored in school systems, but even public health challenges and other global issues, we, you know, we aren't called upon to assist with, but, but we probably could be helpful. 
I, I think one, so this is a cool, this is where I was wanting to kind of end and wrap up over time too, is like, how can we help and what can we do? Um, as a, an example of like the innovative stuff that's gone on in the past, when the Ebola outbreak was going on, there was two groups of behavior analysts that were involved in that uh, in, in a very small way, not as like behavior analysts providing something, they were a part of a team working on things. Um, one of them was developing the only approved, adopted by the WHO checklist for um, a way to interact and, and uh, treat people that were confirmed with Ebola at the time. And so when patient zero for the US landed in, I believe it was Atlanta at the time, the problem was nobody wanted to work with the, the, the fear of contracting and the death and mortality rate is, is far higher on that. But that was actually a group of behavior analysts developed and designed that. And I don't think that's for everybody, but we do have some, some track record in, in applying these sort of skills in really fascinating ways. Um, I guess fun anecdote <laughs> on top of that. Um, but are there, are there other avenues that you all see maybe of where people can start, uh, you know, like where if you had an extra five, 10 hours a week or whatever to start pursuing, like would you go in a certain direction to try to help out in the situation? What would you develop next as a behavior analyst? I'm going to jump in on that just because I've thought about it recently. And as I watch myself on my own screen, touch my face like 5 million times because my hair just always makes my face itchy. Um, <laughs> I think one thing some behavior analysts should do, it won't be me because I don't have the time to do it, but um, should really develop some really good behavior interventions for getting me or other people to stop touching our faces and... <laughs> you know, and come up with like hand hygiene, you know, thing like we should be able to put all that out on videos and have that go viral on Facebook and, you know, all that other stuff and get that out to parents who can start teaching their kids to do the same thing. Um, I mean, I think that's one thing that, I mean, we're all faced with it and I'm sure most of, I don't know, maybe you're all better at it than I am. I'm just horrible at not touching my face. Um, and, but I, every time I do it, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but I can't stop. And so understanding those motivations, putting in some interventions and self-monitoring strategies, I don't know what it is, but something to help us, you know, do better. I remember, and, so and for me, this is kind of a systems uh, level thing, because I remember Ron Van Houten talking about the research that they did in traffic, uh, pedestrian crossings and such. And it was very clear that until they had the right amount of research, but also they were going to the right events, they had the right resources to be able to put something in the, a typical, a, a certain modality or medium to be, you know, it, it took all of those things, the networking, everything to be able to go in there. So for me, it's, it's almost like uh, this is clearly shown that our, our field, our industry, many areas outside of our field as well um, are lacking that like cohesive response and readiness to be able to move on these sort of things. And that's something that hopefully we start putting attention into. Hey, Kelly, I was going to say, um, if you ever want to come across the hall on the third floor, I do have a clinic for habit reversal in case you want that. Uh, but, it, but in all seriousness, I, I mean, I do think that's ways in which we can think about the application of behavior analysis to current situations. I'm not saying that touching the face is the, the most pressing issue right now, but why aren't behavior analysts part of the solution for, for you know, things like touching your face or how to... Um, how to maintain, you know, working with our kids to maintain that six foot distance and, and things like that. I think that's right in our wheelhouse. For me, you just have to move so fast to be able to be a part of these conversations. And that I feel like that's one of the hardest part is like, we're, we're not ready to move as quickly as we possibly can in all these other directions. We're doing the best we can to try to move as fast as we can with the service models that are in place. I think you really hit it there. It's, it's kind of um, taking a step back and, and realizing that we have to think about things differently now. And so maybe the question isn't, I'm going to design something that looks familiar to me for this behavioral challenge that we're facing, but it's me asking my neighbor, like, hey, man, how's it going? What do you need help with? Or calling up my local government and saying, I'm a trained behavior analyst. What are you guys having difficulties with? How can I help out with? And it may be something that we didn't even think of. We, we may be asked to do stuff that we never would have thought of or imagined ourselves doing. Um, but within that process of just, you know, being a good community member and getting out and helping, I'm sure opportunities will present themselves to us pretty easily. Well, I, I mean, and really what you're talking about right now, David, is, is the C word, collaboration. 
Um, and that's not something that we've always done really great uh, or do it done really well. I, you know, even at, at, if you go to conferences and even at the Calabo conference, we brought in speakers from other disciplines talking about areas that people have said that are important to them and no one shows up because they're not a behavior analyst. So we don't give a crap about what they have to say. So what I would also challenge people to do is if we want to have a seat at the table, we first need to get to the table first. And how are we going to get to the table? We're going to get to the table by being collaborative by being willing to bring the skill sets that we have to bear to do meaningful, you know, socially significant things in, in other groups that might require us to have, you know, alter or acquire some other repertoires in terms of how we get along with others, how we talk about what we do without using, you know, too much jargon, um, how we might have to be flexible in, in some of our thinking. And, and I think that honestly, that's part of the reason why we haven't been more part of these like larger conversations. And I think I, I see this all the time happening where people are like, gosh, you know, we're so well positioned to, to talk about like social distancing. That's so weird. But if we operationalize and say, stay six feet apart, that's a lot easier. I mean, we already think in those terms as behavior analysts, but that is going to really require us to do something that we have demonstrated time and time again that we are really crappy at doing. And it's being willing to listen to other people, being willing to collaborate and being willing to, to be flexible, to be able to slowly get to that seat, maintain that seat, and then maybe even grow and have more seats. Yeah, I believe Ron Van Houten and them, it was like somewhere around 15 or 20 years is what he said it took by the time it was like idea, research, network, presented, had the opportunity to be able to, to get that research put into practice across the U.S. and like actually affect what was going on. Yes, but we're at a behavioral cusp right now, right? We're at a global behavioral cusp, you guys. This is it. So I don't, th I think we can shave off 20 years. I say 20 months. Let's get some shit done. And you can move fast when you collaborate. I was going to add to the collaboration piece, Sarah T and I have experienced this. I, I, to go out and be, say something a little bold here, I think we need to significantly rethink the way that our field is led. Um, I look at the different professional organizations that exist and the fact that I'm now, like as someone who is one, in one of them and seeing the fact that some of them can't even be in the same room or have a conversation is a problem for our field. It is a huge problem. It is something that no one talks about. I wasn't even aware of until I started a professional organization. And it's something that we should really be embarrassed about. The fact that we have five different professional organizations and no one wants to talk to each other is a problem. And we really, really need to solve that. If we expect us as clinicians to be cohesive, we need our leadership to model that behavior. It's kind of interesting to think about that. We also don't talk to other professions and we don't necessarily come across, at, across as humble enough to realize that we need to be collaborating with people from other fields to solve complex problems, right? I, so, I, Sorry, I was gonna say, ahead. I totally agree with you, Sarah, and thank you, Mary Jane. Um, part of the reason this popped up was uh, Sarah, David and I all hopped into a Zoom room and it was pretty clear once David articulated it for me, the part of the frustration I had over the last few weeks um, when we were talking to different people on social media was that I was like, we were looking for that leadership position or that collaboration amongst leaders of like, here's the direction to go. And it's part of the reason this panel even formed. So thank you all. But I think it's because of that vein of people are looking for guidance in this situation and, and we're falling short in some regards. Well, I think, I think part of the reason that, that we're falling short um, is because I think we've held on to these like, we've always done it this way and so we should kind of continue to do it this way kind of way of thinking um and i think that there's a, there's a place for that and then there's a place to say well gosh as society has changed and as our service delivery has changed and as cultural norms have changed we kind of have to change with it um and, and i think that that's been challenging you know for behavior analysis i mean and, and ryan you and i've spent uh, you know innumerable hours talking to pat Fryman about this in terms of like People that adhere to Bear, Wolf, and Risley is like the sacred text of behavior analysis to never, ever, you know, be changed or improved upon again. But th that, that wasn't the intent of their writing. Um, and so I think we have to look at, you know, how we need to respond to different environmental uh, contingencies differently. Um, and, and that goes for our, our leadership, too. And, and again, I, I do think a silver lining of, of COVID-19 is really going to be an opportunity for us to like get out there, be honest, talk about things and, and really, you know, affect change because gosh, we really don't have time to like, you know, fool around because this is a serious situation for, for every single person in the United States and especially for the, the people that the consumers of, of behavior analytic services. And so, you know, perhaps this is 
um, a, a moment in time for us to be able to really like take a step back and think, how can we do this better um, for everybody? And, and I certainly hope that that is an, an outcome of, of what's currently going on. I just want yeah. to jump in. So, I mean, evolution's not easy, right? It's never been easy. And I'm going to totally bastardize Dave Wacker's, um, Matt, maybe you can help me, on his, with the first time the fish jumped out of the water to walk on land was not easy, right? That first fish probably didn't make it very far, you know? And so we have to think about that too, and that we're in this process and we're all evolving and it's not going to be easy and we just have to keep jumping out of that water and we have to keep trying um otherwise we are going to just stay and do what we've always done and i don't at least on this panel none of us want to do that and it looks by comments <laughs> nobody at least who's attending this want that to happen um and so we just have to keep jumping out of that water that's a really great point, Kelly. And I really think, and my mind goes to, okay, where's our action items and who's doing them for our next visit, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so we have these points, you know, that we've all talked, we've got three or four main points. I don't think we let, let it go, Ryan. I think that we come back to this and yeah. we put actions together and we put people together and we start putting our action items into practice. So not just what, here's the problem, but here's our proposal for the solution. Glad to keep meeting. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's great to kind of like, you know, to take a page out of the Seinfeld plan book. It's like Festivus, let's air our grievances, but now let's move forward to like, what do we, we do about it? And again, I think you, you know, you have a highly motivated group, let's capitalize on it. Um, let's continue to, to be innovative because gosh, guys, I think we could do some, some great stuff. So thank you for bringing that back to that we really need to focus on. So now the now what piece? Yep. Let's not duplicate resources. We have so much brain power and knowledge. So to have multiple groups and multiple people creating the same content for the same people makes no sense. Let's come together. Let's figure out best practices, guidelines, standards. Let's put out all the, you know, Tina's talking about a resource repository. Let's do that collectively for our field. Let's not fight about whose website it's going to be hosted on. Mm -hmm. I dig. So we're wrapping up. Um, one of the last questions I had here was, how can we increase the level of compassion and understanding and give uh, some support uh, right now for the community? Um, which I think we've hit pretty, pretty good in different ways from y'all. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you all. Appreciate it. But is there any closing words of wisdom in addition that we want to throw out there for people? Um, the point of the code word compassion was to build into this last question. Um, that was one thing that I think we're, we're all been championing or learned to champion in the last few weeks as a result of this. But is there any final words of wisdom? I was just going to say, I think connecting is really important. We're all feeling so alone and isolated, um, maybe personally, but certainly also professionally. So I think creating these environments where we can connect and support one another is vital. So thank you, Ryan. I think, that, <laughs> I think social distancing is a misnomer. Um, it's physical distancing right? It's not social distancing. Like we need to be the opposite of emotional distancing. We need to be emotionally connecting right now. And I'm really grateful we have technology to do that. But I would say take a moment to make sure that we're physically distancing, but that we're socially connecting or emotionally connecting every single day. Cool. I dig. Um, I will commit to brainstorming with whomever has time here uh, to kind of think about like what we could do as a next step. Um, I'm totally glad we got through a lot here. As someone mentioned here, this is uh, could be surface level potentially. We could talk about this for probably days, right? Um, so if you all want to reconvene, I'm glad to reconvene at some point. Um, so there's, I guess, my commitments. Glad to reconvene, organize. I'm glad to also chat about where we can maybe push some of the folks, even if that's emailing them um, every single resource that we had in that drive folder, but I've also copied everything that's been shared here as well. So I can push all that information to people. Um, I think that's a follow-up is like, check out the resources. There's a lot of things that people have been putting together. See where those resources are coming from too. Um, so that we can maybe, uh, if you find something that's in vain of what you wanna do to try to help out, you know who to start helping so we're not duplicating those resources. But so that'd be my, my personal close call to action. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I would just say, I mean, if we're going to put like a benediction uh, on drop this. Drop the mic. What? I said drop the mic. Let's hear it. <laughs> no, in addition to, you know, collaboration, in addition to, to compassion, um, I also would want to say uh, gratitude. Um, what I have been uh, encountered time and time again um, over the last couple of weeks are, are people being willing to, you know, carve out time to do things for other people, share resources for other people. And if nothing else, like this has been this hugely, you know, connecting human experience. And so I'm, I'm deeply grateful. I, I have so much gratitude to, to everyone. And, and I hope that, you know, all of you on the panel, I mean, my gosh, we just kind of threw this out last week and we're like, Hey, this sounds kind of cool. Do you want to like spend some time doing this? And everyone said, yes, everyone, you know, brought resources to bear. A lot of you, you know, we're strewn across the United States. Mary Jane Wise, I know it's past your bedtime right now. I know it's past your bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so again, like, I'm, I'm just so grateful. And I think that if we can maintain the connection, collaboration, the, the, the gratitude, this is the good stuff in life, you know, in the midst of all of this shit show, it's the great stuff. And so I just thank you guys for modeling that for everyone. We'll continue to do that. And I'm Brian, I'm committed to helping work uh, on an additional panel resources, et cetera, whatever we need to, to bring to bear um, to, to help, you know, wrap our arms around everyone in this field, RBTs included, all of the families to, to just to do better and, and to show up for each other. A huge thanks to Ryan and Sarah for organizing this. You guys are awesome. I, I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone, but I think we can all agree this was really fun and we enjoyed being a part of it. So thank you. It's all Ryan, you guys. This was just me being like, hey, Ryan, do you want to take this on? Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all right. It's always an opportunity to share, which is part of the game that I got into a couple of years ago when I started doing this sort of stuff. So um, I, was, I realized quite early on that I run out of shit to say. And there's far more people that have a lot of fantastic things to share and a lot of experience. So it does not move anywhere without you all. So thank you. I owe each of you a thank you. Um, to wrap up real quick, I will be, uh, as soon as we close out of this, you will get a feedback form to enter. If not, for some reason I had error since we have a million Ryans in here for some reason, I will also be sending it out on an email invite or an email right afterwards too. That'll probably come in about an hour because I'm also going to get the video posted so people can watch it and dig back into there. So everything's going to be coming through that. Um, and let's give some more claps or praise into the chat. And thank you all. I think that's, that's it. Appreciate it. Mary Jane, you can go to bed. <laughs> thank you. I think I will. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> all right, presenters, I'll hit you up on the panelist thread in a little bit um, when I get everything kind of together. Good night. Thanks, Thanks. all.